Okay, good morning, everybody. I'd, I'd like to welcome everybody here. This is the first time in three years we're doing this. It was always an annual tradition, this in Memorial Day. Um, and so after the pandemic, it's, it's nice to see a room full of people. It's nice to see a table full of veterans. Um, it's one of, the things that, one of the things that makes Millbury a little bit unique. Not every school does this, anything like that. So I just wanted to say welcome to everybody before we get going. Um, today is the day that we recognize those who have protected and continue to protect our way of life. What we call Veterans Day was first called Armistice Day. And it was originally designed just to honor the veterans who served in <coughs> World War I. But times have changed. And today, we honor veterans who served before World War I, after World War I, those who served during time of war and during time of peace. It's all veterans, not just those who didn't make it. That's what Memorial Day is for. So all of our veterans have protected our democracy, our freedom, our way of life. Today, we honor and we thank them. Tomorrow, we should honor and we should thank them. Every day thereafter, we must continue to honor and thank them. They have given us the chance to live in freedom today and the opportunity to look forward to tomorrow. They have given us every day and they have protected every freedom. The best way to honor our veterans is to take an active part in maintaining our freedom. We must teach, or teach future generations what it means to be an American. We must volunteer in our communities, vote in elections, and take care of our veterans and their families. We have to try to make America be the best America it can be. While most of us here feel that our country is the best country, and any veteran here who has served overseas could probably attest that our system isn't perfect, but it's probably the closest thing to it. That's for sure. So without them sitting up here, we wouldn't have the freedoms that we have. But without you guys sitting out there, because you are the future, we don't have a tomorrow that's anything like today. The service members we honor here today came from different walks of life, but they shared several fundamental qualities. They possessed courage, pride, determination, selflessness, dedication to duty, and integrity. All the qualities needed to serve a cause larger than oneself. Many of them didn't ask to leave their homes to fight on distant battlefields. Many didn't even volunteer. They didn't go to war because they loved fighting. The overwhelming number of those who experienced combat wished that they never had. They were called to be part of something larger than themselves. Those who volunteered and continued to volunteer during times of peace were not lacking in courage or cause. Their service saw them in safer places during safer times, but they were no less important in defending the country. Our peacetime veterans are all ordinary people who responded to a calling. This calling changed their lives so American citizens as a whole could enjoy their lives. They knowingly placed themselves in a position where they knew they could be in danger. That reality was something that was drilled into my head when I was 17 years old. Some of you know this, some of you don't. You usually are 18 when you join the military. Your parents can basically sign you away when you're 17 if you don't want to wait that long. Um, that was my case. Um, my two best friends and I went into the service within 24 hours of each other. Um, one went to the Navy, one went to the Marines, and I went into the Air Force. Um, and I'll never forget, we went through basic, we went to our advanced training with the security forces for the Air Force. Um, you know, of course I joined the military and I thought, oh, you see the world. Yeah, I went to Lackland Air Force Base, I went to Brooks Air Force Base for a time, and then they sent me back to Lackland Air Force Base. I was a little, I was a little depressed, but, and there was one guy there, I don't know why he signed up for, he was my friend. And we were doing some, you know, advanced training, rifle weapons training, and he said, I don't know why I'm here. I just did this to get money for college under the GI Bill. And the instructors look at, looked at them and said, your money for college is later. Your job right now is to defend the United States of America and defend its constitution. Nobody's gonna ask what you're doing here and they don't care about you getting money for college. About three weeks later, our training wasn't even done. And it was, it was, this was 1987, it was toward the end of the Cold War. At 2.30 in the morning, they put us aboard C-130s and started flying us toward Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. The rumor was there was a nuclear strike on the East Coast. And they were just sending us there. Nobody told us why. And I'll never forget, one of our instructors who came on the plane with us looked at my friend and said, do you think anybody cares about your college right now? And it kind of hit home, like that is your job. So even though people serve in peacetime, uh, your commitment is, no, it can change in a minute. 
And those, you know, up here who have served in the military, some of the things they do seem a little odd. Um, we landed in Oklahoma. Some of us were um, going to go up to um, is Ellsworth in South Dakota, but they canceled it. It was a drill, obviously. There was no nuclear strike on the East Coast, but they canceled the drill, and we all got sent back to LACNA. Um, but it hits home, you know, so there you are, 17, 18 years old, and you are definitely part of something bigger than yourself, that's for sure. So the bottom line is drafted or volunteer, combat or not, each veteran answered the nation's call because they wanted to protect a nation that has given them, and let's face it, it's given us so much. Since the first shots were fired at Lexington and Concord and our Revolutionary War began, American men and women have answered to the, na the nation's call to duty. The women and men seated before you have answered that call, all of them. Tens of millions of Americans have served our country. Over one million have died in service to our country. Memorial Day in May is for honoring our war dead. Today is for honoring all of those who served. They too have sacrificed. They chose to serve. Many of them interrupted their lives and worked working toward their goals to be part of something far greater than themselves. Their military service impacted them for the rest of their lives. Time away from loved ones, memories and experiences from their time spent in service in many ways shaped how they make decisions, how they treat others, and how they view the world. So could you please offer our veterans a woolly thank you for their service. So I'd like to start, and this is the tradition for those of you, I'm not sure if anybody in this room has been here for one of these, um, I open the floor to the veterans and they introduce themselves, they talk about their service, maybe when they served, the branch they were in, any experiences they wish to share. And after that, what we do is we open it up. You guys are free to ask the veterans questions. Teachers are free to ask the veterans questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the end of the table with somebody most of you, if not all, are familiar with. Um, it's Mr. Gasco. He's a former student here, graduated in 2006. And Mr. Gasco, and we'll work our way down the table this way. So Mr. Gasco, take it away. Good morning, everybody, can you hear me? I don't need the microphone, do I? Okay. Um, you know me, I'm Keith Gasco, um, school resource officer here. Uh, before that, in 2006, um, I enlisted, I graduated high school here and I enlisted that summer in the United States Marine Corps. Um, I spent almost five years in the Marines. Um, I was an infantryman, um, 0311. Um, I served two tours in Iraq. Uh, I deployed to Iraq in 2007. I spent most of 2007 in Iraq. I uh, came home for six or seven months, did another workup, went back to Iraq 2008 into 2009. Um, those deployments were a little different. Um, the first one being a little more what you would consider an overseas deployment to be. Uh, the second one uh, was a little more about trying to get Iraq up and running, uh, training Iraqi police and, and military over there. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. I got out and came back home. Um, and uh, that, that's, a, that's all I have. And uh, we'll, we'll wait for the question portion. Go ahead. My name's Roger Collette. And uh, in 1967, when the draft was out, I, I joined the Navy. And the Navy in 1967 said, you got 90 days before you go to boot camp. So I, they said, sell your car. and do so about a, in August, I sold my car because I wasn't going to use it for a while. And I went to boot camp, came back from boot camp, gave me 30 days leave. And then I was shipped out to North Fork, Virginia, and I stayed. I was going on the USS Intrepid, an aircraft carrier. That all of, in 1967, every aircraft carrier that we had in the United States was over in three at a time. And then when they stay about a year, another group of carriers would replace, take their place, and the other three would come back to the States. Some of these carriers have 6,000 sailors on. The one I was on was 3,500. And seven days before Pearl Harbor was attacked, the Intrepid was put in the water. They just built it, and it was three football fields long in 1941. That was a big carrier back then. And I served in Vietnam in 
handling weapons, bombs, 1,000-pound bombs, 500-pound bombs, and I used to run the elevator with the cats. We used to put six cats with 300-pound bombs, and they, they end up going up to the flight deck, and then the, another crew puts them on the jets. And uh, I, there was two, two of us in the uh, ammunition room on a night shift, and our night shift was like at 11 o'clock at night to 11 o'clock in the morning. And we were working with another G.R. Peterson was working with me. And he had a bomb, the, the bracket we used to handle it with the chain fall. Every bomb that was brought up to the flight deck, somebody had to pick it up with a chain fall. And uh, the, the uh, little spring in the front broke and Peterson fell down and the bomb rolled on his arm and it was really bad. He broke his arm, he was screaming. I picked up the 500 pound bomb out and he got his arm out. I got him, I couldn't, he couldn't go up the ladder. We had the elevator, but it doesn't have any controls inside the elevator. It's not an elevator you go up and down on, it's just for bombs only. And I put him, I helped him up, he was bleeding. He was blood was squirting out of his arm. He was bleeding. I got him in the elevator. He was standing up. I said, sit down. He sat down. I, s I went around the corner, ran the elevator up to the mess decks, got him up there. I climbed up the ladder the other way. <coughs> I opened the hatch at the mess deck, and I got help getting him up to the hospital. Hospital was right at the end. Like, next, right, you come out of the elevator, the bomb elevator in the hospital was right up here up the stairs and I got him in there and two days later Peterson was flown home. He had a cast, he, his Navy uh, days were over. So nobody can work on an aircraft carrier with one arm broken. That was the best thing I ever did in Vietnam, helping my shipmate to save his life. And the state of Massachusetts honored me July 14th, 2017 I got a citation from the, the president of the Massachusetts State Senate and all, the, uh, all the names of all the members. And I have that hanging up on my wall mm -hmm. now. That's it, guys. Stuart Mohane, and I'm a resident of Millbury. I've been a resident all my life. I graduated from this building, high school, in 1962. From there, I went to college, graduated, and upon graduation, I was drafted into the U.S. Army. I was, uh, I Went to my basic training in Fort Georgia, uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. In my advanced infantry training, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. Upon graduation, I got orders to deploy to Vietnam. Uh, there, I served with the 25th Infantry Division in Vietnam for one year in combat. And I re. Uh, after, the, after uh, serving a year, I came back to Fort Devens, and from there I was an instructor in uh, advanced infantry training before uh, I was uh, discharged from the Army into the reserves for four years, and after that I was discharged after my six years. <coughs> Yeah, my name is Bob Roy. I graduated here in 1968, uh, about a week after I graduated. A good friend of mine and myself, we, we knew we were college material, so we went down and talked to the Army recruiter. Needless to say, we signed on a dotted line. I was one of them 17-year-olds, so I up on my mother, asked me, what'd you do today? And I says, oh yeah, by the way, sign this. <laughs> my father, took part in the invasion of Normandy at the Omaha Beach, so my father knew where I was coming from. 
Mom didn't take it very well. So, so we went in the Army under what they call the buddy system. I don't even think they have that anymore. Basically, we stayed together all through our training. We wanted to be a Green Beret Special Forces. We stayed together through our basic training, advanced infantry training, parachute training. We started our Special Forces training, and at that time, Vietnam was roaring, and uh, they were looking for volunteers to go to Vietnam. So we looked at each other, and we raised our hand. That day, we sent us right home for 30 days. When we went to Vietnam together, they separated us. That's the only time you get separated under the buddy system. So they want you to concentrate on the group, not an individual. I'd be afraid if you put family members, good friends together, I'd be worried about him, but there's probably three or four on the other side that I wouldn't be paying attention to. I did two tours in Vietnam. Uh, probably figured it out. I still haven't learned to stop raising my hand, so. <laughs> First year I was infantry. I humped the machine gun. The second year, I was a crew chief on an armored personnel carrier. Uh, came back from Vietnam, got assigned to the 82nd Airborne. I was with the 173rd Airborne when I was in Vietnam. Uh, back to 82nd, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, they wouldn't make us, per se, play the Green Army, Blue Army war games that they used to play in the state. So I tried out for the battalion softball team and made it. So my last six months I played softball. So they flew me all around the country playing softball. So it worked out pretty good. Come home, I'm the post commander of the VFW in Millbury. Uh, I'm the president of the Vietnam Veterans Association in Worcester. And like I said, I still haven't learned not to raise my hand. So. And I have to say this, I was feeling pretty good when I walked in here, but now that I look out in the audience, I feel older than dirt. So <laughs> I, I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Brian Presley. Um, in case the name sounds familiar, my daughter Jocelyn's right over there. Say hi, Jocelyn. Why are you, why are you just embarrassed her? <laughs> well, <laughs> but not too much. I'm done, I'm done with that. Um, I joined the National Guard, the Army National Guard, in 2000. Um, I was 17, so my mom had to, you know, sign for me. But my recruiter told me um, I, I joined, you know, for the college money. And but as was said, the college money isn't important when it's when there's a job to be done. But um, I joined because my recruiter told me, you know, like we're going to be helping out with natural disasters, um, you know, like hurricanes, earthquakes, things like that around the country. And, you know, like, it, that, that was exciting to me. I just wanted to, you know, do my part, help out around the country. And I went to basic training in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And, you know, I came back in 2001, got ready to go to college. And then September 11th happened. And um, I was ready to, you know, go help out with that, but they never called me for that particular thing. But because of, you know, September 11th, they changed the mission of the National Guard to, you know, like be supplemental to the regular army so that um, during deployments, you know, things like we could, you know, backfill where necessary. And in 2004, we became necessary in Iraq. So um, that's when I was sent out to um, help out with Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, I was deployed from 2004 to 2005, um, came back home, Served for another uh, what, five years after that, and um, yeah, just got out. In, I got out in 2009. Lived in Millbury since. Well, yeah, lived in Millbury since about 2009, and um, yeah, that's that's my story. Hi, I'm John Lannon. I came from Cambridge and Selfridge Street uh, below Holy Cross College in Worcester, and I moved to Millbury in 1970 when I met my wife. We got married. I joined the Marine Corps at 18 years old, and uh, I was in Vietnam for two years. Uh, I was highly trained. I was a recon. Uh, I was an infantry man. My brother joined the Marine Corps at 17, he was in Korea, and my uncle joined the Marine Corps at 17, he was in the Second World War, and then we had a traitor, he was in the Army in World War I. <laughs> and uh, 
And then I had a great, great uncle in uh, Civil War. He was in the Army. But uh, uh, my, my journey started at Paris Island. I went to Paris Island, and I went to advanced training in uh, Camp Lejeune. Then I went to Recon, which is uh, kind of like a ranger thing, and trained with rubber boats and uh, everything you can imagine, and uh, repelling. And uh, then I went to 29 Palms to do desert training. Then I ended up on a ship and sailed across the Pacific. I went to Hawaii where I trained for another year, and then the whole bit, the uh, whole uh, first battalion, fourth Marines, we all went to Vietnam, and uh, we were in helicopters, landed in Vietnam, was there for uh, 65 and 66, we were the first ones in, I probably was one of the first ones out, and then I came back to Camp uh, uh, Quantico, Virginia, where the FBI is now, and I uh, did a lot of jobs there, I ended up a platoon sergeant, and uh, acting gunnery sergeant, and uh, then I wanted to get married, and I didn't want to stay in and go back to Vietnam, so I got out. Thank you. Hi, I'm George Murphy, and I li I live, I've been living in Millbury for the last 15 years. I graduated college in 1974, and I wanted to be like Mr. Polano. Pal you know, I wanted to teach. And I spent two years basically substitute teaching and I didn't get any offers to go to the big leagues. And while I was in college, there was a fellow who was 11 years older than me and he, he, he was able to uh, not go to Vietnam and he was stationed in uh, West Berlin for uh, five years. And he told me it was a giant party. And uh, I wanted to do what he did. So I signed up for basically the same types of specialties uh, that he did. And sure enough, I get to go uh, to language school in Monterey, California, one of the prettiest places in the United States. I, also, I got sent to Germany in two years, and I was right on, you know, I'm sure you guys have already studied the, in fact, it's the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and you, got, you guys uh, studied it, I was right there. I was right at the, uh, not when it fell, but when it was occupied by the other guys. And I could see my counterparts on the other side. And uh, so uh, after two years in Germany, uh, the, the, they, uh, there's a guy called a sergeant major. He runs a battalion. He's kind of like the top enlisted guy. And he says, you know what? You're too smart, Murphy, you know, uh, to be here. Uh, we're going to send you to OCS. So they sent me to officer training school, and I came out as a, a new second lieutenant. I got sent to Fort Hood. I did a lot of uh, odd jobs, uh, like motor pool officer, company XO, executive officer. That's the guy who's second in charge of uh, a company. And finally, I got transferred to the uh, uh, second of the 67th, which was, uh, at that time, the first battalion in the Army to have the M1 tank. And uh, that was interesting. I did, I did my Fort Hood t time th for uh, five years. And after eight years of serving active duty, I transferred into the Army Reserves. And I had interesting jobs there. But the big thing was uh, I became what they call a, a J-2. It was a one-star general in, who commanded reserve forces. And our job was to protect Iceland, of all places. And uh, so I get to do that. and as you know, working a civilian job during the day, but in weekends I'd fly to Iceland, you know, for planning conferences, and I, I met my uh, counterparts in the Navy and the Air Force, and that was all interesting. And uh, I was able, able to make it a career, and I, you know, retired with 20 years, and to this day I get a good pension, and also the Army's paying for my health care, as we're speaking yet, so that's my story. My name is Chris Bailey. Uh, I graduated high school in 1986. I uh, went to school, but didn't do very well. Bunked out, so um, I had to figure out another plan to pay for college. So I joined the National Guard, like Brian did, um, 1987. Um, and then in 1990, uh, Iraq invaded, uh, invaded Kuwait and the um, Gulf War. So I was a military police officer. 
I joined the military police officer, uh, military police, because they had a $2,000 sign-on bonus, so extra money. That's why I picked them, and I didn't realize that they did. They were um, one of the first to help get deployed to um, to Iraq um, to help with the uh, the war. And most of my mission over there was we um, what do you call it, followed the tanks, and we picked up the prisoners and um, took care of all the um, the prisoner wars. That was my primary job. Um, I was only there from you know for like 11 months, um, and then after in 1996, after my six years was up, I got out because um, I was I figured one war per person was good enough for me, um, and that's my story. That's it. I'm Roger DeRozier, and um, as a senior in college. On December 1st, 1969, I won the lottery. Not the kind of lottery that you're probably thinking about. It was uh, the draft. Anyone whose number birthday was under 165 was pretty much guaranteed that they were going to get drafted. And I was number 91. So as a senior in college, I knew very well that I was pretty much going to get drafted. And I decided that uh, I didn't want that, so I started looking into various military branches of service. And I chose to enlist into the United States Air Force. So upon graduating, I had uh, delayed my entry into the service to September, and when I got to uh, basic training in Lackland Air Force Base, I uh, expected that I probably wouldn't necessarily uh, be going anywhere uh, in the war line, but because I was a college graduate, I was going to be part of President Nixon's Vietnamization program. And what his program was, was to turn the war over to the Vietnamese. And in order to do that, the Vietnamese needed to learn English. And so I was going to go over to Vietnam and teach the Vietnamese English. So pretty much every college graduate that year was put into a program, okay, that was sending uh, people to Vietnam to teach English, and that became my job. So from 1971 to 1972, I went to Vietnam, and I spoke, and I rather taught English to the Vietnamese for that year. Uh, the last three weeks, however, uh, because I had a French minor in college, I also uh, was taken out of the classroom, and I translated uh, the Army standard operating procedures from English to French for the Cambodian Army. Uh, myself and a major, we worked for 14 hours a day, translating 250 pages of standard operating procedures from English to French for, uh, for the Cambodian Army. And they had asked me to uh, extend my stay for six months. I agreed, but the Air Force said no because they were afraid that that would not, uh, that would interfere, okay, with my having to change my different job description when I went back to complete my four years. So I didn't get to do that. So I did come home, and then when I did come home, uh, I ended up going to uh, Westover Air Force Base out in Springfield. And uh, then I came and got out of the service. And I got a job here at Millbury High School where I taught French for six years and then <coughs> taught in my major in history and taught with Mr. Polano, Mr. Lyons, and Mr. Cobra. And I retired in 2006 from here, probably because 
you know, I had Mr. Gasco as a teacher, and he, you know, graduated in 2006, and I said, gee, I've had it. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Makes a lot of <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Terry Burke Dotson. I also went to school here in Millbury and I graduated from Millbury High. And my daughter, who is also named Terry Burke Dotson, um, she was supposed to be a boy and she was supposed to be a junior. And my husband was in Tokyo and I was at Andrews Air Force Base. And she came out a girl. So, um, I just named her the same as me. She's a juniorette now. It's caused us a lot of problems. But she went here, and I really have to encourage you to listen to your teachers here because they are dedicated to making you the best person you can be. That's their goal, and I have a, so much thanks to give to Mr. Polano because, <laughs> um, you know, I understand that when you're a teenager, you know, you have difficulties and stuff, and he really helped my daughter get on the right track, and she now is a doctor of physical therapy at St. Vincent's Hospital. That's quite an accomplishment because I almost gave up hope when she was here in high school, and uh, he, he got her turned around. So listen to your teachers. They're here to help you and give you direction. Um, why did I go into the military? Well... Before I went in, I already had an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree. And um, I was working, I had taught in South Boston High School during the uh, race riots, and I said, what the heck? This is insane. You know, I wasn't, I've all this education, and I'm a warden for high school kids? This is crazy. I had freshmen that ranged in age from 14 to 18. And I said, enough of that. I gave up on teaching. And uh, I was doing some counseling, and I had Vietnam veterans coming in, and they were, I, I didn't understand what the heck was going on with them. So I said, you know what? I remember JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And my friends were already over in Vietnam, and I said, you know something? I can do something medical because I was so good in science. I says, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get into medical. And you had to pass a test. Women only filled 10% of the military and they were their own entity. I don't know if you've ever washed mash before. Hot Lips Houlihan was in charge of the nurses. The nursing, the women were a separate unit. They didn't, they didn't mix with the men. And so we didn't have rifles. We had reading every day. Um, I never touched a rifle. I had to go to a reading class, learn how to read. Okay, let's do that. And then finally I uh, got out of boot camp and uh, selected to go into uh, field medic school. And in a field medic school, that's like an EMT glorified. Uh, you learn how to, you know, take care of boo-boos and stuff like that. And for your final exam, um, I, I get so upset when I hear on television, well, we didn't want to send our million our military in to get hurt well you know we're kind of trained to do that and what we did our final exam we were out in the desert all kinds of snakes around and uh, they had guys laying out on the on the ground covered with moulage moulage is fake guts okay it, they're made out of rubber and they strap them onto you so our job as a field medic if we were going to pass for Vietnam, uh, we had to go out into the desert, find them, but they made it a little bit more, more interesting. They smoked the whole area, so you couldn't see beyond your hand. Everything was smoke, and we had to go out and find them, and they said, oh yeah, keep your head down because we're going to be firing. I said, okay, I'll keep, <laughs> I'll keep my head down. I was one with the earth, you know, going out there to find my guy, but we got him. I found him. And then I had to bring them back. If you could not go out in that smoke and with the guns firing over your head, you didn't belong in field medic school. So, I mean, we're trained to go into dangerous situations, trained to do that and bring out the people. And I felt very confident, you know, 
Uh, the training in the military was excellent. So that was the, the in, that was the Army National Guard, and from there I went into surgical training, and I loved that because I really wanted to be a doctor, but uh, I couldn't pass calculus. Calculus messed me up. Anyway, so I started with the Army National Guard, and then I went to the Air Force Reserve, and when I was in the Air Force Reserve, I did a lot of surgeries and stuff like that. I loved being there. Um, and then uh, I switched over to the, I, I tried to get commissioned, I was 45 days too old. 45 days too old, a new law came into effect. So I said, okay, I'm gonna have fun. So then I switched over to the, um, if the Navy Reserve, and then the Navy Reserve um, attached me to the um, Marines because the Marines were gonna get deployed. And I, since I was a field medic, um, they put me there and I had to go give the, the Marines their shots. I wrote, we got excellent training in medical. Um, I wrote prescriptions. I gave shots. I did medical records. I fixed boo-boos. You know, all these things because the training was so intense. And this is the thing in this, this group right now. Um, if you're in a unit, nobody is allowed to fail. Now, some people are good at some stuff and others are not. Nobody in your unit was allowed to fail. If, if you didn't know how to, to take temperatures, if you didn't know how to do blood pressures and stuff, it was my responsibility to train you so that you could take my place. So the training was excellent. And here in the school, I know everybody has a different personality, but the thing that you can do to help yourself, help the school, help the nation, is to be kind to each other. And if somebody needs help, if you're a little bit better than they are, help them out. That's what we do in the military, and the military is a very tight unit because nobody can fail, nobody can fail. And uh, the last place that I went to, I switched back to the uh, Air Force, um, and I went into, I did something different this time, I went into the air, air terminal, and uh, the air terminal, you know the, the, you know the lady who sits behind the desk when you go in an air terminal, they have a computer, and they say, oh yeah, you're going where? Okay, here's your ticket. Okay, well it's the same thing, only we had rifles, <laughs> you know. So um, uh, I enjoyed that, and we were at Bagram Air Force Base, and it was actually three women that were running the air terminal at night, and uh, the action was pretty close. And I remember one morning, I'm sleeping on my stomach, and all of a sudden my, my clock goes like this. I said, whoa, that was a close one, you know. And then one night, uh, it, the, the action really became close, and uh, we, we could hear the explosions. And the, uh, the younger people, I, was, I took care of everybody, trained everybody, came running in, oh my God, what are we gonna do? They're over, and I said, look, that's not our job. There's somebody out there, you know, fighting and, 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 and doing something with them. That's their job. We have a job here. Now you can either sit there and flap your arms up and down and go crying, or you can choose to do your job. We have to get these people out of this terminal and on that plane before the plane gets hit. You know, so I said, make your choice. Either sit there and flap your arms up and down or get going and get your job done. And uh, so everyone has a job and you have to be good at what you do. And here in high school, you've got a job. And I hope that you help each other. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is Mr. Settle. Uh, this is one of the first time I've ever done something like this. So I'm uh, terrified actually, which is kind of a bizarre thing because I'm in front of you guys for most of you uh, many times a year. but. Um, I've never spoken to one of these. Ms. Pano's kind of asked me every year since 2010, and this is the first time I was like, all right, let's give it a try. So I almost wussed out, too, almost wussed out, but I saw Officer Gasco, and I was like, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> um, so like Officer Gasco, and I believe another gentleman, I can't remember, uh, uh, apologize, but I served in the Marine Corps. Uh, it's their birthday today, so happy birthday, Marines. Um, and. It was 1998, I was graduating high school. Um, like some of you, uh, you might have come from homes that weren't so great. Parents weren't making the best responsible choices. I wasn't probably making the best responsible choices. Um, I graduated, but it was not It was by the hair of my chinny chin chin, and I was looking at trying to get into college, and trying to afford college, um, which were two things that were, were grim. And one of my friends who uh, was,
was uh, meeting with the recruiter, said, you should come with me. And I was 19 at the time. I graduated later um, uh, by my age. And so I went in, and the recruiter did what they did best. They sell um, roses and rainbows. And I said, this is amazing. I love this. I want to do this. Um, and I had always talked about service. I was an Eagle Scout. Um, I, I love to, I love the idea of the military, not not seeing that, you know, you, you always hear through history or through your grandparents, you hear the, the glossy Dover version. Um, so I was really excited. I thought this was a great idea and I was gonna uh, serve as a legal aid in the Marine Corps, so on the headquarters side. And so I signed the line. I didn't even think about it, didn't talk to my parents. I just signed the form. I went home and I think it was similar to someone else. Like it was met with two different reactions. My father was like, okay, are you sure you thought about this? And my mother screamed and yelled and threw things. Um, uh, but I, I went in um, down to Paris Island. I, my first station was in North Carolina and then I got sent to Hawaii, uh, Marine Corps Base Hawaii. I was there for three years. Uh, third, I was attached to an infantry unit similar to like Officer Gasco, but I was on the headquarters side. So I did not end up being legal. I ended up being uh, records and pay. So I was sort of like the, the clerical side of it. Um, but because you're attached to an infantry unit, your first couple of years are anything but clerical. It's much more security and, and going out in the field with the infantry. We, because 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines is way out in the Pacific, their rotations are different. They do um, different tours in uh, Okinawa, Japan. Um, so part of their job, it was sort of remnants of the Korean War, is to kind of be in the Pacific as a show of force. Uh, they go on to different floats and stuff. Uh, I, because of headquarters, I stayed behind, but I got to experience uh, Japanese culture, got to go into the mainland Japan, into Tokyo, and so that was a lot of fun. I got to go to Australia um, to work with the Australians in uh, kind of joint activities, and then September 11 happened, and I was in Hawaii, so that's a six hour time difference from here, so we woke up to everything being completed, um, and that changed, and I imagine other people that served around that time, it, it, the mentality of the of the military change. They went from peacetime when I joined, you know, for again, similar to some other people like college money to a much more focused mission. Uh, but around that time, that was 2001. So 2002 was the end of my first contract. And being out in third Marines, we weren't the first to go. We weren't the first to deploy. That was people in Lejeune and in California. So by the time my contract came up, I decided to do the reserve side and said, hey, listen, if they're gonna call me up, then they're gonna call me in the reserves. And they did, I was home for two weeks and they called me up and said, you're coming right back in. I got attached to 1st Battalion, 25th Marines out of Devons at the time. And we mobilized, I remember showing up to the sergeant and I was checking in and he looked at my record and said, you were just on active duty. And I said, yeah, he's like, mumble, 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 talking to somebody. He's like, so you're gonna go advance party, you leave in two weeks. So I went, wait, I've only been home for two weeks. So I was already mobilized and sent into Lejeune um, we were on the flight deck waiting to go, and all of a sudden we got put back on buses. The buses went back to the headquarters. Um, the next morning we found out that, and this is the time uh, there was a story of an Army Reserve uh, soldier named Jessica Lynch. Um, she had gotten some trouble um, and was rescued, thank goodness. But it kind of shined a light on the reserve side being a little bit um, not as prepared maybe to be in active duty as, as they, the military had hoped for. And so my unit got re replaced and the other active duty unit sent over. And that, that changed my perspective of, of military from then on. I had a hard time with that um, because I had come from active duty and these guys had just been home and the reservists sent them back. And what well, well, let me rephrase, the reservists and federal, the military sent them back. And that was hard for me. That was hard for me to, to balance this idea of, of being in the military and active duty, but to send friends that I knew, and I did lose friends. I mean, there were people that I knew that didn't come back. And so it was really hard. I had a hard time, which is why I just never really spoke about it for so many years, because I had to kind of learn to understand the reasoning behind it and stuff like that. I got out in 2006. Um, someone else had said I met my wife, and I had that choice of do I stay in or do I uh, go, and I, I chose to leave which I'm grateful for because it gave me a second career, something I didn't expect, which was education, and to come in and to help other people that might have had the similar experience as me when I was younger and to put them maybe on a better path, a path. Not that the military is not a great path. It changed my world. I would not be the person I am today if I didn't, number one, get away from the world that I was living in with the friends and the, the bad choices that I was in. 
Uh, but you know, the Marine Corps taught me so much. Um, and I imagine all the other branches teach that same thing. It's about uh, caring for the people that, that you're around, your, your friends, your family, um, supporting them, right? Uh, service to your country. I mean, we know our country isn't perfect, but like Mr. Polano said, when you go out and you start seeing the other groups, you start realizing that there, we have a pretty awesome model. And when everyone is doing the right thing and working for the right reasons, uh, great stuff can happen, right? I mean, we do, we really do. And so it was, it, it was life changing for me. And um, I would recommend anybody to it. I would caution that you talk to your family first, maybe, unlike I did, um, to kind of go over the pros and cons, because there are cons. I mean, anyone who's up here will tell you there are some good parts of the military and there are some challenging parts of the military. Um, especially if you want to make it a career, it's difficult. But I, I will tell you that um, it, it was life changing and one of the one of the greatest times um, of my life. So, all right, thanks. I don't know what to say else. <laughs> Terrifying. Huh? Um, uh, I'm going to open up to some questions. I usually I'll ask the first one just to get the ball rolling. So um, for the veterans, not, you don't have to answer every single question. Uh, you know, if you want to sit one out, that's fine too. Um, my first question is, is basically, what, do you, what did you bring from the military? Even if it's something, your time in service. Um, for instance, I can say this. Um, from the military, I have never, ever overslept, ever. Put it this way, I set an alarm every morning, and my oldest son writes it down on the calendar when it actually goes off. That's how few and far between. I'm just, I have never overslept for anything. And that was, it was, it's a little thing, but it's just weird. I've just always been, since then, I've been a morning person. And that's just the way it goes. And I'd love to start with Officer Gasco because I was telling him this the other day up in my room. Um, when he came back from, from boot camp, I'm not sure how soon you came back, the first time I saw you, um, he, he was a changed person. So, Keith, if you don't mind. Just <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't think anything specific. I've always kind of been a morning person. Although, I don't know. Anyway, high school, um, I was not the best student. Um, I know Mr. Polano had uh, spoken to some of you guys about that and people asking about me and how I was here. Um, I actually, believe it or not, graduated um, right, right around where uh, Ari is sitting right there um, in the library after finishing summer school my senior year. Um, I don't know if anybody knows that. Um, so that's when I graduated, summer school graduation with Linda Swenson and uh, Mr. Rhodes at the time. Um, and I needed to get away from Millbrook. Um, I, I needed more structure, I needed the team atmosphere. Um, coming, to, coming to high school, I, I came and did just enough to get by, and I'm sure Mr. Lyons could attest to that, uh, so that I could play sports. That's all I wanted to do. I came in to get by, to go play football or baseball or whatever. Um, and the military changed that a little bit. Um, the Marine Corps uh, instilled, you know, discipline, integrity, um, you know, things that I think that I had as a student, but they really honed them in um, and made me who I am. Um, much different person. I'm still a screwball to a certain extent. Um, that some of you might not be able to see on a, on a daily basis, um, but my colleagues probably have. Um, there, it, it instilled in me that there's a time to have fun, and I tell this to my five and six year old at home, there's a time and a place for everything. There's a time to have fun, there's a time to, for lack of a better term, screw around, and there's a time to put your game face on and, and do what you need to do and do what needs to be done. And I think that the Marine Corps did that for me. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm back here, so. Anybody else? Oh. Um, <laughs> what did I bring back? What did I learn? Uh, material things don't mean anything to me. What I learned is the simple things in life is what's most important. I don't need to have a fancy car, fancy house, bunch of jewelry. Anything material doesn't matter to me. And I've instilled that on my kids. It's not what important. That's not what's going to make you who you are. Uh, 
what I brought back is I like uh, helping people. I still do it to this day. I raise my hand whenever I can if I think I can help somebody else. That's why I, I don't care too much about myself, but I care a lot about other people, even if they're strangers. Uh, that's what I like to do, and people tell me that that's what I'm good at. That's what I'm known for. So I have no problem with that at all. <coughs> and uh, probably never heard of it. I don't even know if, I don't know if you study Vietnam at all? Is there anything in the school books nowadays? That there was a Wichita defoliant called, uh, which had Agent Orange. Agent Orange was a defoliant. The U.S. government they even started using it in Korea. They spray it on vegetation and it's gone within 24 hours. The leaves are gone. Everything's gone. It's barren. Well, the government didn't tell us as it causes a variety of different cancers and ailments that we still get notices, or I get letters in the mail every couple, three months of new diseases that they attribute to Agent Orange. Just like now you're reading about the uh, drinking water in Camp Lejeune, you've probably seen it on the TV or the newspaper. This here was Agent Orange. That's one thing I brought home. One thing I have to deal with, the VA takes care of me for it, but which it is what it is. I don't, know, I don't have anyone to blame. My brain, I raise my hand, so I, I just deal with it. But no, the caring for other people, that's what I learned, you know. I really did, and it really, and it pays off to this day. I still enjoy doing it, and I'll keep doing it as long as I can. Hi. Um, the thing that I, that impressed me most about um, the military, um, I'm a, I'm a school person, you know, I've always been, <laughs> seems I, I always love school, but I understood and I realized the importance of knowledge. Um, if you were going out there to, to uh, help somebody who had gotten hurt, you have to make a quick evaluation of what's going on. You have to have that knowledge um, in order to be able to help somebody else. And fortunately, I got pretty good at it and I was able to train people and when when they have knowledge and can to help and can help somebody who's in distress, um, then they can teach somebody else. So the accumulation of knowledge. So once you have something in your head and you have knowledge, there's um, you don't become a pawn for anybody else. It's across. Oh, I'm sorry. It's across the board. Um, people who want to take advantage of you take a, take your weaknesses and use your weaknesses against you. But if you are smart, I'm not saying street smart, but if you are smart and you have knowledge, you won't be led astray and then you can also help people do the right thing. So that's what I got out of it. I, I love teaching in the, in the military um, and I always train the people to take my job over. I, I trained them to the highest level I could get them to and nobody failed. <laughs> so there we go. The one thing I appreciate from my time in the military, how wonderful we have it in this country. And it's important if, you know, just to be able to come back and polish my boots. But what we have in this country. <laughs> Sorry about that, after, after session. What we have in this country is wonderful. Enjoy it, be thankful for it. The reason I said after session, I used to get a lot back in the 60s, just in case you were wondering. Yeah. 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 Uh, my case is uh, I was a great athlete. I could I played every sport, weightlifting. I was a weightlifting champ, all of that, but I was definitely needed some instructions and some discipline. And I was in a dilemma, and I quit school. I didn't like school. Then after I quit school, I wish I stayed in school. But I ended up joining the Marine Corps. And during the Marine Corps, I got my GED test. I went to, got to a degree in college, and I attended UMass. So I very important to go to school. And I learned how to be a good delegator. And I, and I was well-trained, so I moved up the ranks. And uh, 
One day you're running two men, the next day you got 300 men. So that, that was very good for me. It taught me a lot. I started my own business, been very successful. And like Bob, I like to give back to, I like him to the people and neighborhoods or whoever. So school is important. Right, John? Yep. One of the things that I think I learned great, uh, greatly was uh, I thought that I kind of understood people in, uh, coming from Millbury, but joining the military, I got to know a lot of people from all parts of the country. And by going to Vietnam, also learning different cultures and learning about other different people. It really broadened, okay, my outlook about other people and gave me a greater understanding uh, about other people. And I think that enhanced, okay, who I became. And I think that was a very important part of um, who I am. I think oftentimes um, we don't have the ability or capacity to really understand others until we really meet people from other areas of the world or even uh, parts of our own country. Does anybody have a question for the veterans? I'm just going to repeat that so everybody can hear. The question was, what hobbies did you guys have before you entered the service? Oh, Mr. Gasco's hand oh, is right up. Yeah, being super boisterous <laughs> in Mr. Polano, Mr. DeRoser, and uh, Mr. Lionscraft. <laughs> no, I think it was, it was very much a hobby for my family. That was my best hobby. <laughs> Um, I started swimming at Briley's Pond, and you know where that block is opposite the, uh, the, the mill? Um, we never had lifeguards or anything. We'd climb up these rusty, I'm not going to, maybe I shouldn't tell them this, but anyway, these rusty spikes on the side. We used to climb up on the rusty spikes and get on top and dive off when a truck came by so that we were clean, you know, we were putting on shows. And then I learned to swim up at the Singletary Nook. And when I was a senior in high school, um, I got my instructors, uh, swimming instructors, and I took over as a, tr as a teacher up there at the Singletary Nook where everybody came and got free swimming lessons. And then I went into college and got on the synchronized swimming team. So my hobby was swimming. Anytime I could get to a pool, I was in the water. And so I was a synchronized swimmer at... Uh, okay. Yeah, and so I, at, at, at uh, Bridgewater. And uh, my coach told me that they were trying out for the International Water Follies, and I tried out, and I was accepted, and I toured the U.S. and part of Canada. So I made a good living swimming, and that was my hobby. It was something I really enjoyed. So that's it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, I was a uh, city weightlifting camp, the only one weightlifting camp. My son's a national champ, and, uh, but I never had the discipline that it took to go on and on and on because I, I went in the Marines and I never looked at weights again. And uh, and I could have probably got on a weightlifting team there, but I wanted to be a Marine. So I didn't gave that up. And uh, when I was 37, though, I started again. I came in third in the state. So I was an old budget. <laughs> That's it. That was my hobby. Lots of hobbies. Mine was motorcycles. Oh, yeah. And uh, in the Army, I got myself a motorcycle. I had a pickup truck and a motorcycle. Rode the, uh, you know, through Arizona on it. And also, when I was in California, I went to Yosemite. Went to Germany, I couldn't afford to have both. Uh, motorcycles in Germany were pretty expensive. But uh, I kept on riding motorcycles, and I still do today. I'm set, I just turned 70 uh, about th three months ago, and my wife told me to get rid of the motorcycle. Instead, I downgraded and got myself a a uh, medium-sized uh, uh, Indian uh, scout. So I'm still riding that around town. You'll probably see me. <laughs> My hobby was and still is video games. I love playing video games. Um, actually, I picked up one while I was actually deployed um, writing. Like I liked writing um, novels and stories. 
and action adventure fantasy stuff. I while I was deployed, I liked reading a lot. So um, one book that I got was the novelization of of um, the Fantastic Four movie from 2004, and it was so terribly written that I was like, I could do better than this, and so I did. I started writing, and um, yeah, th those were my hobbies. My hobby was uh, starting as a freshman uh, building race cars, circular, circular racing. Years ago, there used to be a speedway right on Route 9 in Westboro, Mass, a Westboro Speedway. That's where I started. I used to race Friday nights. That's why I never went to a prom or any of that stuff, because it was racing or prom. Oh, well. And I went racing. And I still do to this day. I'm on a race team. We travel a lot. I went to Canada. I love it. Uh, second thing, uh, my hobby, and I enjoy it more now than ever, is I like to make people laugh or smile. Because after you see the bad side for so long and the way things are nowadays, there's not a lot of smiles going around. So whenever I can dish them out, I can. Uh, it leads me into my third hobby. And if my mom, mom, I'm sorry, God bless you. My third hobby was uh, collecting after sessions. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't believe me, you should have seen when I went to the office to get this badge. I broke out into a cold sweat because it was bringing everything back all over again. So. <laughs> You see, that's what I enjoy doing. That's what I enjoy doing, because there's so much crap in this world that don't make you smile. I, I just enjoy making people smile. Does anybody <clears throat> else have any questions? At all. There was. The question was, if you did experience PTSD, did, how did you deal with it, if there was? PTSD? Yes. PTSD. PTSD. I, I don't. Yeah. Right. How do you deal with it? Still uh, dealing with it. Oh, I never ahead. had PTSD until I got married. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny, but my, I had nightmares. And then I used to jump out of bed and I just got married. Just a little later. We were only married a few months, and I used to yell at my wife, who the Holy, oh, holy, yeah. And she finally one night says, you know who the hell I am, get back to bed. I never had a problem again. <laughs> but then later on, uh, about 16, yeah, 16 years ago, I got a call on the phone from some kid who was trying to find out something about his uncle. And I was with his uncle when he got killed. So I knew all about the uncle, but that caused me to have flashbacks again and so what I did is I spent 20 years raising fish building walls I had two acres of flowers and I was very nice and I uh, got control of myself and uh, that's uh, that helped out a lot nature and I was at peace you know? but uh, since then I have researched everything about Vietnam I have a booklet and uh, I don't want to forget Anything. So I'm at peace with it. No, I'm actually still dealing with it. Uh, that's my wife. I forget what's today, Thursday? Maybe Monday. I still have nightmares to the point that my wife gets out of bed, she goes and sleeps on the couch. Which it, I only take two hour power naps. That's what I took when I was in Vietnam. That's what I still take to this day, and it was fifty years ago. How do I deal with it? VA just keeps giving you pills for stuff about the only way. When we came back, there was no such thing as PTSD. We were gun shy. That's what they told us, right? We were gun shy. There was no, but they didn't say anything about no PTSD. There was a whole lot of stuff that we thought was normal that wasn't normal when it finally started to come out. But, uh, I mean, I know for myself, I'll always have it. I mean, it, the pills make it better, but I still have my moments. I was lucky enough not to actually f see any combat while I was in Iraq. Like I was um, force protection. I was up in the tower staring at the dark for 12 hours a night. And um, when I got back, it, was, it wasn't about any kind of experience. It was about the abandonment. You know, like I was overseas and away from my family so long. And then 
I come back and all my friends have graduated, they've moved on with their lives and I'm still, you know, stuck where I was. So my, the thing that I'm doing right now, like I'm in therapy um, and there's a big stigma in therapy. Don't let anybody tell you that therapy is bad. Like it's awesome, it's incredible. Like it will, it will help you out. So um, if you're feeling any which way, you know, talk to a counselor if you can, but um, pills as well, you know, like everybody's taking pills, but uh, therapy definitely helps, you know, giving, having somebody to talk to, having somebody to um, tell all of your experience to, experiences to somebody who will listen and not judge, you know, like that's, um, that's a big help. I don't understand kids that my time wasn't the same time as his time. They we all had different times, different decades, so every a lot of things changed. So it, it, his experience, even though I might have the same experience, is totally a different experience because so of the time frame. So to piggyback off of that, I, though, I, think, realize that. I think one of the biggest things is I still stay in contact with probably four or five of the guys that I served with, and I think that so having, having a relatable experience and being able to talk to them because we all went through the same thing together, I think that that is, is big as far as that goes. Yeah. John had a good point, if I hear again. Uh, yesterday morning at Shaw School, they sent us into the classrooms. And I was paired up with Chris, Chris Bailey. And he was talking about his experiences in the Gulf War and my experiences as a Vietnam veteran, totally opposite. The kids were looking like, how is this so different? Chris, the Gulf War, the veterans nowadays, were okay. rightly so. You know, they have parades, they're honored, thank you for your service, so on and so forth. When I flew in from uh, Vietnam, I landed in Seattle, Tacoma, they advised us not to wear our uniform home. Imagine that, you've just fought for your country and they're telling you, oh, I wouldn't wear, Uniform home. Never happened to me because I was a big guy and I was, I'm going to wear my uniform. I don't care. But I know of guys that got spit on. They called them baby killers. You know, it was a rough time for Vietnam. We didn't get any rah rahs or any of that. But you know what? It was in our head. We didn't want any. We didn't need any. We just did our thing. We went home. Worst thing that happened to me, I went in a bar to have a beer before my flight and the guy that was sitting over here like Brian, when I sat down, the guy moved. All right, that's his privilege, you know what I mean? So well, John hit it right on the head. It's two completely different, My time was different how the veterans were treated. It was, I, got, I got out, I left Vietnam in 66. So uh, you know, when I got on the bus, the guy put his hands over the uh, thing to put the coin in, I didn't have to pay, they let you go through here. Everybody gave me respect. I didn't have any of that experience. So. Was before that, I was lucky that I got. We might have time for one more, and if there isn't, that's okay. Is there any sort of concern, like severe concern, about severe injury or death or anything like that? Well, well, 56 guys killed and wounded, I have. Uh, you name it, I've seen it. Is that what you're asking me? Like, how do you guys like do that around family and like you might be severely hurt or something bad? Have you been in a situation where you think you're gonna your number is up? <coughs> no, uh, you're, you're not scared. No, uh, you're, you're doing your job. Uh, you're doing your job, and uh, if the bullet's there, it's gonna get you, or the bomb. Uh, you don't think about that. You're doing your mission. You're doing your job, and you react when something happens. Uh, somebody gets blown up, and you have to go try to do first aid, or somebody gets shot. Or you're trained to do all this stuff. And, you know, uh, every service is trained different. I was well trained. I could, uh, I could do first aid. I could, I could make a bomb. That's the training I had. So when you uh, you keep you stay focused. See, uh, if there's guys that are gonna come in, there's guys that are gonna do the shoot, and there's guys. Everything is is precision. So you can handle a guy wounded, this guy, uh, it's all going on at once, bombs, whatever, like it doesn't. You know, you're not scared. I never thought of dying, but I 
every time you go out there, Coach, you, you stay in the wrong spot and uh, something comes at, at this. But it, no. And uh, most of the, uh, my guys were, were 18, 19, most uh, young guys. That was my main concern when I went when I was deployed to Vietnam. I wasn't married. I just got out of college and whatever. But when I got over there, I seen what was happening. I didn't mind dying in combat, but my main concern was coming back with a disability. And there are so many veterans from the Vietnam War and other wars too that have so severe disabilities. And you don't see that, but it is there. I think in Vietnam there was 158,000 men that were wounded. Out of those, I don't know how many were severely, but there was a lot of it. And because of the evacuation of the wounded, it was so quick that they were able to save their lives. If it was another war prior to that, that might not have happened. They might have died instead of, but there is many veterans in this country that are severely disabled, and I feel for them. All right, well, I don't know what the exact number is. I think it's somewhere up in the 70 percentile of Vietnam veterans' injuries are not visible with the naked eye, whether it be psychological or whatever. Uh, did I worry about it? The only time I even thought about it, when when it hits the fan, you're not thinking about it. Afterwards, when like things calm down a little bit and we're cleaning our rifle or everything, and I look and your hands are going like that, you know, stop it. You know what I mean? You don't think of it. But the time it hit me, and I said I had went back twice. The first time I went over, no big deal. Second time I went over, I was walking down the runway at Logan Airport. No big. You know, meadows or whatever. I turned around and looked at my folks, and I knew damn well it was a pretty good shot. I might not see him again. That's the first and only time I thought of it. First and only time I thought of it. Because when it's hitting the fan, you can't think about it. You know, you're worried. That's what it. That's what it. It, it amazes me when we were over there, and you know, no one thought about it. You wanna know why? Because we thought of each other. Over there, you had a group of guys, girls, ladies, whatever. You had a group, nationality, color, religion, it didn't matter. We had each other's back, period. So you weren't going to make it if you were, thought you could do it all by yourself. And for some reason, sometimes it, the guys come home and they change. They change, you know, it's not that bad thing anymore, you know. But no, we never thought of it. We always thought of it as the whole, the group. 20 of us going out, 20 of us are coming back, period. Not about me. You know, when you join the military, it's not about you. Uh, selfish people don't join the military. The first person in my office who got killed in the action, his father was the first person killed in Vietnam. His name was Richard Fitzgerald Jr. and he was Richard Fitzgerald the third and they were both from Massachusetts and every year I go out to their grave and they clean it up. You can't forget the sacrifice that some people don't. All right guys, we're gonna wrap it up there. Here's the thing, an email was sent out so uh, your teachers were aware um, that this may run a little bit late. How many people in here usually have first lunch today? Okay. Um, your teachers are usually going to be pretty understanding about that. Um, I would go check in with the teacher. It's almost time for second lunch. They'll probably just send you to second lunch, that kind of thing. So if you want to sit tight here until the bell rings, it's going to ring in like a minute, maybe two minutes. And then at that point, go to your class, go to second lunch or wherever you belong. It is E block. But just sit tight here until the bell rings. You give me a ride home. Could we have one more Not thank leaving. you for the veterans? Well, I'm going to go to Stu's. Huh? I'm going to go to Stu's to pick up the flags for the clubhouse. Oh, okay. Get back to work. Get back to work. <laughs>